Good afternoon, everybody. I'll just give 10 seconds for those that are just coming into the room to make their way in. I'd firstly like to welcome everybody to the second Natural Hazards Research Forum uh, here in Melbourne, uh, graciously uh, uh, at the uh, invitation here at RMIT. Uh, and really great to see everybody uh, come here today uh, to really be focused on research, science and innovation to ensure that our uh, society here, community in Australia is safer, more resilient and sustainable in the face of future natural hazards. My name is Andrew Gissing, I'm the CEO of Natural Hazards uh, Research Australia and uh, I'll MC uh, some of the sessions over the next uh, three days. A bit of a soft uh, opening uh, this afternoon. Uh, we will have a, a broader, more official opening uh, in the morning. Before I uh, go any further, I would like to uh, pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land which we uh, are on today, uh, the traditional owners being the uh, Wurundjeri people of the Kulin uh, Nation. Uh, we're guests uh, on the Wurundjeri country uh, for this forum. Wurundjeri land has always been a place of teaching, research and learning for thousands of years and I pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging and any First Nations people that we have with us uh, today. We've also got the, the message sticks uh, that you'll see here at the front for those that uh, were part of our first forum in Brisbane last uh, year. You'll remember the ceremony that we had uh, around the message sticks which were created by Uncle Marcus as part of our Reconciliation Action Plan and the launch of that plan last, uh, last forum. Uh, these message sticks are an important symbol of shared values, uh, knowledge sharing and safe passage through the sharing process. We have uh, had them since uh, at various events, forums and meetings and we welcome uh, speakers to hold them whilst uh, presenting throughout the forum. So just some housekeeping uh, notes uh, as well. And again, we'll provide some further detail on the, on the overall program tomorrow morning as well. Uh, so firstly, uh, welcome also to those folk that are not uh, here in the room that are online. Uh, all up, we're about uh, getting close to 400 registrations for the Natural Hazards Research Forum uh, that we're holding. Um, so uh, we're being live streamed across Australia and New Zealand. Uh, we're also very much focused here on, uh, on, the, on the safety, so make sure that as you're moving around that you're keeping aware of others and various uh, potentials for slips, trips, etc. So just be careful as you're moving around the, uh, the building. We will be using some stairs to access some rooms upstairs. There's also the lift as well. So in terms of the overall uh, setup, you've got uh, this auditorium here and you've also got some breakout rooms on, on level seven. So if you're on level five and level seven, you're in the locations where there'll be various sessions over the next uh, couple of days. There's also bathroom facilities located up uh, between the two floors. So if you follow these stairs that are directly just outside here to the left, you'll find the bathroom facilities uh, close uh, by. Um, at the conclusion of today's uh, program, we'll be uh, inviting you also to our welcome uh, drinks and nibbles, uh, which will be at the end of our uh, session here this evening. So with that housekeeping uh, uh, there, I want to start on our first uh, session, which is all about uh, urban heat. We've introduced this session uh, this evening really about urban heat uh, for, for a couple of reasons. One is the significant uh, impact that uh, extreme heat has uh, in regards to being a natural hazard risk for Australia. We know that it's uh, the greatest killer of all our natural hazards, uh, in fact, uh, the amount of people that die from heat waves, we know from research that was uh, conducted through the bushfire natural hazard CRC, is, uh, is, gra is greater than the sum total of all other natural hazards combined. So it's a very important risk for Australia. It's also a risk which is being explored very innovatively uh, across the country, particularly in the western part of uh, Sydney and also through uh, the city of Melbourne here where we are. So this afternoon's speakers are really going to be focused on about uh, not only the innovation in the heat space, but also around how research and science is helping to inform change in that space as well. So I'll introduce our two speakers in a, in, in a moment. The final session uh, this, uh, this evening is also going to be about big ideas. And so we're going to be doing some workshopping around that and we'll explain that after the, uh, the first initial uh, session. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite uh, 
Uh, Tiffany Crawford uh, to the stage firstly, our first speaker in this Urban Heat uh, uh, panel. Uh, so Tiffany is the co-chief uh, heat officer and director of climate change and city resilience for the city of Melbourne. One of the reasons why uh, Tiffany's project is so exciting is it's also part of a, a broader global network around uh, chief heat officers. And I believe, Tiffany, you're the first chief heat officer here in Australia as well, and no doubt something that we need to think about as uh, heat becomes a more significant issue for our country into the future. So I'll welcome Tiffany to the stage. Andrew. And I've got the after lunch session, so I think I have the unenviable task now of keeping you all awake. I hope you've had a Melbourne coffee, and for those online, grab yourself one now, and I'll try very hard to keep this interesting. And it is a really interesting topic. Uh, I too would like to pay respects to the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung peoples of the Eastern Kulin and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and to any uh, Aboriginal peoples amongst the audience today. We are in the Warring Wombat season which features cool rainy days following uh, misty mornings. Um, the time, it is the time of year that has the highest rainfall and the lowest temperatures. Um, so it's interesting to uh, really reflect on the Aboriginal seasons. How am I getting this to work? It's not, there we go. I've got a beautiful picture of a wombat for you. It's also the season uh, known for the hearts of combatic, which are the, the soft tree ferns, which are the major food in the area when there are no fruits available. So a little bit about our work here at the City of Melbourne. In my role as Chief Heat Officer and Director of Climate Change City Resilience, I job share with another wonderful person called Krista Milne. And we are responsible for leading a pretty fantastic team who, uh, broadly speaking, are focused on mitigating the city's carbon emissions while ensuring that the city adapts to a rapidly changing climate uh, and that also at its heart supports its people and businesses to respond to a changing context. More recently, last year, Krista and I were appointed into this um, interesting titled role, the first uh, in, in Australia as Chief Heat Officer, and I'll talk to you a bit more about the context of that appointment in, um, in a bit more detail shortly. City of Melbourne declared a climate and biodiversity emergency in 2019, and in doing so, we joined with 140 um, uh, sorry, 1,400 jurisdictions uh, in 27 countries across the world uh, in this local and international movement. The emergency acknowledges that temperature rise of over one and a half degrees will lead to major and irreversible damage to ecosystems and that over a million species will face extinction. From the banks of the Yarra to the trees that line our streets, and the world, our famous parks, Melbourne's unique environment and coveted li livability are at risk from climate change. In fact, we know that climate change is already impacting Melbourne in many ways. We know that immediate action to reduce emissions and adapt to these impacts are needed now if Melbourne is to remain a city that is livable for future generations to visit, to work in and live. Extreme heat is one such risk and is Australia's most deadly natural hazard. Known as the silent killer, it <clears throat> is responsible for more fatalities, fatalities than all other natural hazards combined. However, as a natural hazard, we do know that it does not have the same level of awareness, understanding or management attention. Our governance and legislative arrangements are more disjointed than other natural hazards. We spend a lot of time talking about the reasons for this at the City of Melbourne, as I'm sure we do in other jurisdictions. The reasons are complex, including that there is no clear, easy media vi visual to report on. The data around heat impacts often lags the event, and the impacts may often be unknown altogether. 
We do know that due to climate change, Melbourne is experiencing more hot weather and heat wave events than ever before. We currently average 11 days greater than 35 degrees and expect this to rise to 16 days by 2050. We have been fortunate the last couple of summers, it's been a bit milder, but with the ending of La Nina, we know that this is coming to an end. So it's very important that we continue to, chat, to plan and to ramp up for the coming hot summers. We also know that exposure to extreme heat impacts infrastructure, businesses, our plants, our animals and people. It causes heat exhaustion, heat stroke, and ultimately, unfortunately, death. The 2014 Victorian heat wave contributed to 167 excess deaths that caused 600 hospitalizations that we know of. Research undertaken on the 2014 Melbourne heat wave showed city businesses lost an estimated 37 million in revenue in just four days. We will have more prolonged and frequent periods of drought, which will create ongoing water security issues, even in our city. In 2019, Melbourne had only 374 mils of rainfall, which was down 40% from our historical average. The middle image on your screen shows the impact on our beautiful Royal Park during the millennium drought, uh, which Melburnians will well remember. Um, we experienced rainfall at that time 14% below average. So a secure water supply is absolutely critical to a livable future. We know this because that particular period um, saw all of our parks, many of our parks, not all of our parks, turn to dust bowls and street trees that were suffering from a lack of water. And it wasn't just during that period, it was also for a decade following. And that's why we continue to prioritise water sensitive urban design, especially using stormwater runoff to support our precious trees and gardens. We've incorporated rain gardens and tree pits, as well as underground soil trenches that increase soil moisture for our trees. We're doing more though. We're also encouraging private buildings and developers, helping them to intercept rainwater runoff to irrigate their parks. Like any city, we are a complex and constantly evolving ecosystem. Melbourne has a relatively small number of residents, but this number is growing. We, had to, we have a large number of visitors, over a million a day, and over 16,000 diverse businesses with 11 distinct neighbourhoods. As the city becomes more densely developed, we also need to manage increasing risk to human health and well-being that is arising from urban heat. Our municipality's population is expected to nearly double in the next 20 years, while the area of Greater Melbourne will increase from 4.5 million um, to over 8 million. Our challenge is to continue to balance competing priorities, development objectives, creating a city that responds dynamically to climate change and provides places of refuge for residents, workers and visitors during extreme heat events. This means adjusting the way we plan, build, communicate and resource our work. Melbourne is really proud to be the first Australian city to map all our key initiatives to the UN SDGs or the Sustainable Development Goals. There are 25 SDG targets related to disaster risk reduction in 10 of the 17 SDGs, which I think firmly establishes the role of risk disaster risk reduction and extreme heat risk reduction as central to achieving the SDGs. Just want to draw on um, some work we recently did engaging with our community um, around heat related illness and people in vulnerable um, sectors of the community. We know that people in high rise buildings and public housing are disproportionately impacted by heat. And in 2022, we worked with residents of these buildings to understand their experience during heat waves. The group surveyed represented those most vulnerable, the elderly, children, those with health conditions, and those speaking languages other than English. And the insights were very compelling and gave us much more nuanced understanding of how far-reaching impacts of heat can be. I'll share some of those stories. Some of the things we heard included from a Kensington Towers resident who's 87, 
The windows are fixed and there's no way to open the windows during hot days. There is no ventilation. Another Kensington Towers resident shared, I had an air conditioning unit installed in my flat last year, so I put that on. I worry about the cost every time I turn it on though. We also heard that night time is the most challenging time for many people. Their buildings remain extremely hot. There is no escape and it makes winding down very difficult. People spoke about sleeplessness and the impact that this has on mood and behaviour of those around them. And the long-term impacts of heat waves are felt acutely by people with pre-existing health conditions. Fortunately, our council plan sets out a long-term vision of a city with healthy rivers and parks, supporting the well-being of people and wildlife that use them of a thriving food bowl to the west of Melbourne that will continue to provide most of our fresh food and vegetables. Supported by residents in resilient neighbourhoods who increasingly grow and share their food where they live and they work, where our buildings and streets keep people safe during heat waves and where everyone will be able to access ways to stay cool. So back to our role as Chief Heat Officers. Uh, I've gone too far. Uh, how do I go back? Just give me a sneak peek and making sure you're all awake. There we go. The City Champions for Heat Alliance initiative is run by the Adrian Arsht Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Centre. Quite a mouthful, so we just call it the Arsh Rock. And in January 22, Arsh Rock invited City of Melbourne to become a, a City Champions for Heat uh, action, action for Oceania in recognition of the Lord Mayor's uh, leadership in particular and the work that the city has done in the past on climate change. The initiative seeks to achieve three things, to put a spotlight on the critical issue of heat, to develop tailor-made solutions to address heat hazards and to use champions around the world to advocate for greater action. And the Alliance is a global initiative bringing together experts, governments and decision makers to develop and deliver heat resilient solutions. The role provides the City of Melbourne with an opportunity to drive a more targeted program and response to extreme risk heat, <laughs> extreme heat risk across the city and opens opportunities to global financing initiatives, information sharing and other support. Very recently, on the eve of International Women's Day, Ash Rock announced Senator Hillary Clinton as Global Ambassador for Heat Health and gender, and in her new role through a partnership with the Global, Clinton Global Initiative, Secretary Clinton will raise awareness about the impacts of climate-driven extreme heat, especially focusing on the disproportionate health-related risks to women and girls and the many solutions that are available. So back to the city of Melbourne, uh, we have been acting on heat for some time before joining this coalition. Um, you um, may be aware of our Cool Roots online map. If not, uh, I really encourage you to go to our website and have a play with Cool Roots. It provides practical support uh, during heat waves, cooling the city through urban greening in our urban forest, planning and investing in new infrastructure for projects like Green Line, which uh, you can also find information on our website about, which will provide a cool green corridor uh, through the city preparing for the future with resilient urban design and planning. And um, since 2013, we have been implementing a heat wave and homelessness program to provide highly vulnerable uh, people living in the municipality heat respite options. Um, and that program includes access to after hours cool places, um, such as pool passes, cooling methods that include water bottles, um, towels, sunscreen, hats, really practical solutions, and importantly, communication. All of these efforts so far have been focused on the ultimate aim of cooling Melbourne by four degrees. What we have been able to do in terms of um, uh, really focusing on heat since our appointment though, is to bring together the various um, and somewhat uh, fragmented functions on heat that sit across the organisation and, and coalesce those functions and be more coordinated. We've established the Heat Leadership Group with representatives from climate and um, city resilience, community wellbeing, city safety, strategic communication and parks and city greening. 
We all come together now more regularly to coordinate our work, share our plans for the future and communicate with the public. This has been really useful, um, particularly through this last summer. We were able to be a lot more targeted in our communications with the public. We've developed a heatwave response plan, which if you'd like more detail, you can find also on the website or reach out to me. And the plan includes notifying service providers, agencies and established community organisations that interact with people who are vulnerable um, uh, around heat health alerts. We've held community heat health workshops, which you can see up on the screen, um, through which visitors and the community um, were invited to take part in the conversation around heat and heatwave planning. And over 400 people participated in these workshops where they received information and resources on how heat can affect health and wellbeing and detailed information on five simple ways to survive during heatwaves. Uh, I've talked to you about Cool Roots briefly, which, as I said, is a website um, which you can access on the go, on your smartphone if you like, to plot your journey through the city. And rather than taking the fastest route, you might then take uh, the coolest route. Uh, it really takes in, um, into account your architecture, um, uh, the best route protected from sun and heat. And by using cool routes, you can make your walk or cycle journey around the city more comfortable and help to protect yourself from the worst impacts during the day. We've also translated um, neighbourhood maps into the top three languages for each um, neighbourhood in our community. Many of you will be well aware of our fabulous greening um, work. I was hoping to share with you a video today, but I've spoken too slowly, so I can't show it to you. I will share a link, though, with the organisers. It's a brilliant uh, video that talks about our fabulous greening work, and it was produced by the BBC, um, and really highlights how important greening is to our community. Many of you will know that our tree population is vast. We have over 800 sorry, 80,000 council-owned trees worth more than $800 million. And trees are a defining part of Melbourne, of our parks and gardens and our green spaces. And they contribute enormously to the livability and the cooling of our city. This is all managed um, by our colleagues in Parks and City Greening through our urban forest strategy. Just show you a few brief examples of where we've been able to implement the urban forest strategy. Um, this is an awkward and dangerous intersection, or was, near a school in North Melbourne. And in that particular example, you can see where we nearly doubled the green space. Here in Southbank, another example of greening the city through the expansion of open space and converting roads and streetscapes into green spaces. South Bank Boulevard has converted from grey to green with more than 400 new trees, a play space and additional street furniture. We're also planting understory every year and on um, this street we've had researchers tracking the return of wildlife. Last year they confirmed that native butterflies have returned to the area so next we're hoping that birds will follow and uh, hoping to see the return of fairy wrens in this area. You can track uh, our urban forest through Melbourne's Urban Forest Visual. Again, that's available on our website. And um, I was going to show you here the video on the Urban Forest Fund, but I encourage you to go to our website and um, to check out the BBC video that uh, is there. Most recently, um, we have finally been approved by the state government to proceed with our sustainable building design amendment, which proposes changes to the planning rules in the city um, to ensure future development achieves best practice, because we really can't leave all the hard work to our street trees. We need our private realm, which makes up a great proportion of the city to do some of the hard lifting. The standards included environmental, environmentally sustainable design, or ESD, um, most importantly, specifically calling out urban heat island responses. And this is a green wall that was supported by the Urban Forest Fund through the, um, uh, uh, the work of Parks and City Greening for the Loop Bar in Melbourne. And we expect to see the proliferation of these types of greening initiatives throughout the city in the future over the coming decade. So to wrap up, looking to the future, we are looking to establish a new model um, to incubate 
to iterate and evolve resilience concepts in response to extreme heat risk and vulnerability in the city of Melbourne. We'll continue to work with diverse collaborators to drive design, prototyping and testing of new community place based interventions. As a city champion for heat action, we have um, uh, the following areas to focus on, including planning for enhanced community information and outreach, tactical cooling and greening interventions, and through declaring a climate and biodiversity emergency in 2019, We've um, been endorsed to take a really strong advocacy position in relation to areas where we are dependent on other levels of government. And this is a newer area for council to be bold in. Um, but some of those advocacy priorities in relation to heat include retrofitting public and social housing, additional support for our vulnerable people, and recognise, recognising heat waves as an emergency. We've been doing work on heat maps and engaging with the community to understand where those heat um, areas of heat to focus on are. Uh, that work is ongoing and there's a little map there where the community have been telling us those areas that they're experiencing heat are located. And I wanted to talk to you about a partnership we have with Climasense, um, where we are developing an innovative new tool to map heat hazards and strengthen responses to extreme heat events. Glamasense is helping us to um, test a heat risk platform which aims to boost the city's climate resilience using technology. It uses live weather and climate data to identify real-time heat risk insights. There's uh, lots of other things I could talk to you about, but I'm running out of time and getting the wrap up. Um, we are looking at tactical interventions which we would love to partner with researchers on, such as misting fans, light coloured and reflective surfaces, and permeable paving. There's also community services uh, concepts such as neighbourhood heat ambassadors and working with our community to communicate, to create trusted sources of information, developing heat kits, and uh, continuing to develop and strengthen those ties into the community. So, um, I promise this is the last slide. Listening to our community happens in lots of ways, and this note was recently left at the City Library in relation to a prompt we left asking what libraries mean to you. And I've ended on this note because of the importance of communi community and collaboration to the focus on heat. We can only respond to the ongoing complex and changing demands of our city and climate change in partnership with community, with you, with service providers and all levels of government, our colleagues in other municipalities, other capital cities, experts and researchers and our international partners such as Arshed Rock, in order to continue to learn and challenge ourselves to share knowledge, to improve service provision and our communication. This is a global movement by 2050, 70% of us will be living in cities around the world. And with rising temperatures and more frequent and intense heat waves, we must continue to raise our ambition to innovate and to prevent human suffering, economic loss, and to protect human health. Increasing climate adap adaptability benefits us all. It provides better amenity for residents, visitors, and workers. It reduces costs, and increases ultimately the value of properties. And most importantly, it ensures we're a resilient, livable city that can withstand climate shocks and stresses such as heat. Thank you. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Okay, just before I welcome our uh, next speakers, you're all probably eagerly thinking about, well, how do I ask a question of the panel? So uh, we encourage everyone online and in person to participate. Questions will be taken from the floor. We'll have some roving mics in a moment as well for the panel, or they can be submitted through the software Slido. Uh, your app is, an app is not uh, required to participate. Simply scan the QR code on the screen in your program, select the stream you're listening to, and enter your question in the box. Uh, questions will be moderated by myself uh, and asked to the panel. Um, so 
we're really excited now to welcome our speakers from uh, the Western Sydney Regional Organisation of Councils, um, uh, Kelly and uh, Judith. Uh, I've been working with Kelly uh, in my old capacity uh, in the Western Sydney area around extreme heat. They're doing some really uh, interesting, exciting and innovative things and I thought it'd be really good to hear uh, and uh, let them share their work with you uh, as well. More importantly too about how science is informing the work. So uh, Kelly and Judith, over to you. Excellent. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, um, Andrew, and also thanks, um, Tiffany, for sharing some of your work. Um, we are very, very excited to be here today and to share some of the work we've been doing in Western Sydney on heat. Um, sorry, just getting my bearings here. Yeah, we are there. Um, so Westrock, we're the West Western Sydney Regional Organisation of Councils. We're a small organisation um, supporting councils in Western Sydney. And today, if I'm right, yeah, um, we will be sharing some of the work that we've been doing under the Turn Down the Heat Strategy. So the Turn Down the Heat Strategy was um, developed by us in partnership with a lot of stakeholders across um, Greater Sydney to really look at um, holistically and collaboratively addressing heat across the city. So today, Kelly, my colleague, and I will be sharing some of the um, initiatives that we've been implementing underneath that strategy. Um, we'll be sharing um, how we've been using research to support some of our work, and we'll also be sharing some of the um, challenges, but also opportunities that we see in this space. Oh. Sorry, upside down. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Um, but before we'll delve into some of the work that we have been doing, we thought it might be useful to really sort of explain when we talk about heat what we're talking about. Um, so when we talk about heat, we often talk about these three kind of different but interlinked components, and we need to be really mindful what we mean when we talk about heat. So those three components are climate, climate change, um, urban heat, um, and heat waves. So why it's important to distinguish between the three, even though they are very much connected, is that they all three have different causes and they require different solutions. So it's, we find it really helpful to really think through those three issues, how they impact our people, how they impact our infrastructure. So what we mean is that when we talk about say, climate change and urban heat, um, those issues can be mitigated to an extent, but we also know that we need to start adapting our infrastructure um, and our services because of increasing temperatures already. But we also need to be very mindful that we need to start keeping people safe during heat waves. That requires a very different response and are our cities prepared for that? When we do have a multi-day heat wave, uh, is our city prepared to respond when things go wrong? Say when the power feels at 50 degree days and our infrastructure feels, what do we do? What systems, what processes do we have in place? A spoiler alert. At the moment, not a lot. Um, again, just to reiterate what um, Andrew and Tiffany have already been um, saying, the impacts of, of heat are, are numerous and quite serious. Um, we know that heat kills more people and more Australians than fire, flood and storms combined, and we know that it has um, cascading impacts um, on all systems of our city. Um, just a bit of context, I don't know if people are not necessarily familiar with Western Sydney, why we're talking about Western Sydney in terms of heat, because heat has already had massive impacts um, on our region. Uh, Western Sydney is away from, say, cooling sea breezes, so we're naturally hotter. On top of that, we've got a lot of urban development happening in the area, so we're creating more heat islands. Um, and um, yeah, climate change is already impacting the city, um, Western Sydney quite significantly. So we're seeing um, uh, the, the temperatures increasing more rapidly than say Eastern Sydney, and we're also seeing more extreme events happening as well. On top of that, Western Sydney is quite large, so geographically it's, it's quite large, but we're also already home to 2.4 million people, and that is expected to rise to about 4 million people in uh, 2040. So again, a lot of people, we've got quite a few pockets of severe disadvantage in the area as well. So again, I'm telling you this because we're putting a lot of people in an area that's already really hot, and a lot of those people are really quite vulnerable to the impacts of heat. 
Uh, we've already seen temperatures of close to 50 degrees in really highly urbanized areas. So again, it just goes to show, uh, we just wanted to emphasize the need to address heat across the city. Um, we've peppered our presentation with a couple of examples of um, initiatives that are happening across the city. Um, this is not a project that we've been implementing, but we wanted to celebrate some of the amazing work that's happening across the city by some of our stakeholders. So I know there's quite a bit of information on this slide. These are some of the initiatives that we've been implementing underneath that turn down the heat strategy that I've mentioned. Um, I'll run through this really, really quickly. However, all of the projects are listed on our website and all of the resources that we will be flagging with you today, you can download from that website as well. So to start off, we turn down the heat. Like I said, it's a collaborative approach to um, creating heat resilient communities and cities. Um, we've released the strategy in 2018 and we've been working really collaboratively with all of our stakeholders across the city to implement action. West Rock itself is a really small organization and, and, and Kelly and I have been doing most of the work. So we have been really pragmatic in our approach and we've been using a lot of external funding to implement some of the work that you've seen here today. All of the projects that we're implementing are a collaborative approach. So for all of these projects, we've been working with leading researchers and with policy makers to make sure that what we're implementing is evidence-based and that it is practical in terms of its application. So the first project I wanted to highlight is Climate Resilient Canopy. Like Tiffany already flagged, uh, urban greening is incredibly important, but we also know that a lot of our tree species are really vulnerable to climate change. So what this project does is um, pilot different um, uh, tree species with and without passive irrigation to really look at what the most sustainable and um, resilient combination is to create that healthy urban canopy. So this is a project that we are currently implementing, so we don't have the results of that yet, uh, but we can keep you posted. So the Urban Heat Planning Toolkit um, was a guidance that we developed specifically for local government across Greater Sydney. Um, it um, looks at strategic and land use planning and how heat can be addressed within that, um, the limitations, say, of the, the planning framework. Um, this toolkit is uh, available on our website to download and we've been extremely happy that it has been used by a lot of councils and the first um, specific urban heat provisions have made their way into the New South Wales planning system as of last year, I think. Um, because the remit of local government is relatively limited in this space, we also did look at the broader planning system and identified other parts, say federal government, say National Construction Code um, and the New South Wales um, planning legislation that required tweaks and changes as well. We've been working with those stakeholders on that. Um, cool suburbs. So, um, the planning toolkit kind of worked within the limitations of the planning um, planning system, whereas Cool Suburbs is really looking at best practice. So this is a tool, it's available on our website and free to download, um, that provides design guidance to create Cool Suburbs. And that, di that design guidance is actually tailored depending on the scale uh, or the typology of your development. So this has been um, developed specifically for government and industry. Um, to use and it's been quite rigor rigorously tested with industry as well. Um, the tool was developed with a science panel um, which was um, an interesting process and it's, and it's created a really robust um, justification for the design guidance that sits at the back of this tool. Um, the tool at the moment is specifically um, geared towards the Western Sydney climate zone, but in the next year or so, we're looking to expand that to cover other climate zones across New South Wales and potentially um, wider as well. Um, Future proofing. So the projects that I talked to you about just now really focus on urban design, whereas like we said before, we also need to start thinking about keeping people safe and comfortable in their own homes. So this project, which was actually released last week, so it's fresh off the press, um, this project really looked at residential building design and specifically at thermal comfort standards and energy efficiency standards, so how much energy we are allowing for heating and cooling for our home. Um, 
And what this found was that unfortunately the, the um, design standards that we are implementing at the moment are based on quite like historical or quite dated climate data. So what that means is that the homes that we're building in Western Sydney today are actually not heat resilient and they're not energy efficient for the climate that we're living in today, let alone into the future. So there's, there's, we've, we've created a few recommendations that we're tabling with our government partners and we would welcome any um, support in this space. One of them is also to really start looking at thermal safety standards as part of our building regulations. So again, that study report's available on my website if you are interested and want to have a look. So HeatSmart is um, quite a different project. So that really looks at um, heat wave management and emergency management for heat wave. Um, the project um, basically existed of, two, existed of two parts. So we've got a community resilience building um, component to this project where we really um, worked with communities and with community stakeholders to build resources and to make sure that people are more prepared for heat waves. We developed a whole range of resources that we're translating in about 10 or so different languages um, and those resources are now available uh, for download on our website and they are being used by our health stakeholders, our community organisations and other stakeholders across the city as well. Um, the other part of this project was the Heat Smart Resilience Framework. So what we found was that in terms of being prepared and being able to respond to heat wave across the city, we really wanted to understand what was in place and what wasn't in place. What we really found was that there are definitely quite a few gaps. So the Heat Smart Resilience Framework um, work with um, did a lot of stakeholder engagement with about 500 different stakeholders, a lot of interviews, and we delivered gap analysis that really sort of outlines um, the key improvements that we can make across the city in terms of heat wave management. And that's really informing our next stage of our work, which is the Greater Sydney Heat Task Force. So this is where we are looking to bring together key decision makers across the city, so across all policy domains, heat, um, health, planning, emergency management across government sectors, state, local government, um, industry and community organisations as well, and really looking at that structural governance arrangement for heat and heat wave management. How do we do this properly? How do we do this well? This is very new um, and we're just embarking on this journey, if I may say so now, um, and we're hoping to set this up and develop a five-year heat smart city plan um, in the next year. So I will hand over to my colleague Kelly who will talk to you a little bit more about how we've been using research and she'll also share a bit more about our heat smart findings. Thank you, Judith. Um, so as Judith has outlined, the HeatSmart Western Sydney program, which we were lucky to work with Andrew on, um, was really looking at the gaps around heatwave management in our city. Um, oh, sorry, that's a cool refuge trial that happened out at Blacktown in our region. Um, and I wanted to talk through those gaps in a little bit more detail because while we have found there's a lot of focus on urban heat island mitigation and climate change mitigation, heat wave management as a potential disaster and natural hazard is an area where we still see a lot of gaps. So overall, the key findings from that project was that we aren't treating heat wave in the same way we are as bushfire, flood or storm. Despite the fact we know that it has huge, a huge number of fatalities associated with heat, we really aren't measuring those impacts very well. We do have some studies around general productivity losses and we also have those excess mortality statistics. But when we really think about those impacts, those excess mortality statistics don't actually tell us the who, what, where, when and how of heat related deaths so that we can develop appropriate policy responses. But it also doesn't tell us about those non-fatal impacts which can also be quite significant on our communities. Um, in New South Wales, we currently don't have a lead agency coordinating heat risk management. I know that's different in other jurisdictions across Australia, like South Australia, but at the moment for New South Wales, that is really seeing a lack of coordination and leadership in this space, and that flows through onto some of the other points that we've found here. So likewise, our key emergency management document in New South Wales only looks at heat wave warnings, so telling people it's hot, 
and sharing between agencies rather than looking at that best practice PPRR approach that we're all familiar with. Likewise, there really aren't a lot of standard practices and processes for risk assessment and treatment in the heat space, and we saw that flow through to some of our stakeholder engagement where people saw the issues before them but weren't quite sure how to do, um, approach those issues or do it in an evidence-based way. And additionally, a lot of the roles and responsibilities in this space is unclear. We know community organisations and local government are often the ones responding to heat wave impacts on the ground, but technically at the moment they don't have a legislative role in heat wave management in our state. So as a result of all that, um, we, when we started looking at what's in place at the moment, there is very little at various levels of government across different sectors, simply because we don't have that coordinated leadership, which is what we hope we can start to get the ball rolling on with our heat hazard task force over the next 12 months or so. So this um, um, table is really just to compare some of the measures we take for flood and fire compared to heat wave. As you can see there, when we go with flood and fire, we have some quite established processes around land use planning, building codes, um, preparedness campaigns, as well as you know, hazard mapping. For heat, we don't have a lot in place other than those initial um, local government planning controls that are now starting to come into practice across a few local government areas. In addition, those community pre preparedness campaigns, when we were talking to communities about heat, a lot of them hadn't thought through the issue that carefully. A lot of people wrongly believed that solar panels would protect them in the case of a blackout. A lot of them weren't aware that if we did have a city-wide power failure, that might impact their access to water, to telecommunication, to fuel pumping, to electronic payments, and the flow and effects that might have if they're trying to contact loved ones, pick up children, commute home from work, and generally manage themselves during that disaster event. Um, in terms of response at the moment, as I said, we have heat wave warnings that occur in New South Wales, but in terms of practical assistance to communities, at the moment, really what we're seeing is some ad hoc approaches to extending opening hours um, across libraries and swimming pools, which is fantastic, but at the same time, there are challenges around people with limited mobility or financial constraints in terms of accessing those types of supports, and we'd really like to see that expanded. So research gaps, given we've got a lot of researchers here listening, we thought we'd point out some of the things that we'd like to see more focus on in future. Um, and many of these fit in that heat wave management sector, just because we see that as a real gap in terms of the way we're thinking about heat at the moment. Um, the first is defining heat events. The Bureau of Meteorology obviously has a definition for heat wave but that is really based on statistical um, abnormalities rather than the actual hazardous nature of that event. So what we're seeing in Western Sydney is periods where we have over a month of 35 degree plus days, and in that circumstance, we can see average temperatures becoming quite harmful for health. And are we gonna wait until that heat wave is declared to have a 50 degree day before we start putting out that messaging and some of those heat wave responses? We really not need to start thinking about at what level are we going to be activating some of those plans? Um, data collection is still a big one. As I've already mentioned, excess mortality is often seen as the gold standard, but it really doesn't tell us about who is being impacted by heat. Um, generally, we see public health campaigns looking at the vulnerable, the elderly, the unwell, the very young, but a few place-based studies at Liverpool and Depean hospitals have actually found that it's majorly healthy young men who are coming in who are doing silly things on 40 degree days like mowing the lawn, running, um, you know, doing sports and then putting themselves in that position. So what does that say about the way that we're actually responding with the public health campaigns? Thermal st safety standards, as Judith mentioned, in Australia we don't currently have thermal safety standards for houses. What should these be? How, what's that going to cost and how will these be implemented? And finally, there's a lot of gaps in social practice. You know, how are people experiencing heat waves? How are they behaving and managing that heat in place? Um, this is another project which I'm going to reference a shortly on the next slide. So this was a cool coding that a few of our councils trialled on residential roads to reflect heat and try and achieve that urban cooling effect. Um, so finally, I wanted to finish off by talking about you know, um, addressing 
science and, and translating that into practice. It's an area we've been quite focused on and I know particularly in the area of natural hazard research, the ultimate aim is to reduce risk in place, so that's a really important thing to understand. So for us, um, research and science has been really critical for identifying the key issues, providing evidence to justify action to our political leaders and our communities, guiding targeted investment, because at the end of the day, local government has limited resources and we want the best bang for buck, as well as measuring the success of responses. Um, but getting from, uh, you know, research to practice is really challenging. And in a few of our programs, these are some of the challenges that we've seen. So um, I might, I think um, in terms of design, so the cool passive irrigation project that Judith mentioned, um, the, the researchers came up with a really efficient passive irrigation pit design, but it was also really efficient at capturing debris and leaf litter. So the councils found that it was going to be overly costly to maintain, and then ultimately, even if it was effective, it wasn't going to be rolled out because the costs were just too great. So working with those on-ground practitioners to find a solution that was ultimately going to see potential rollout in future after the pilot was finished was really important. Oops. I'm going to go back. No, I'm going in the wrong direction. <laughs> anyway, um, the other one, so that cool roads um, trial, cultural and community impacts um, and, and understandings and acceptance is really important. So that cool roads trial was really effective at bringing down ambient temperatures. It was actually quite cost effective because it extended the life of the road surface for our councils. However, a lot of communities weren't happy with the outcome and the Western Sydney youth decided it was a great canvas for burnout. So ultimately, it wasn't it isn't something that's currently being rolled out more broadly just because that interaction between community and the solution wasn't quite there. So just considering some of those externality, externalities and working with you know, on-ground practitioners to make sure different solutions are hitting different parts of the problem. So I'll finish there given I've stuffed up the slides for you and I know we're running a bit over. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thanks, Kelly. Um, so we're just, uh, we've got a microphone just uh, roving around. Just happy to take some uh, questions from the floor. We've got a few minutes uh, for questions before our next session. Uh, anybody got a question uh, there? We got the microphone there. Do we have the uh, questions there from Slido as well? Just while the microphone's going across, we've got a couple of questions here for people to look back at there. Let's go to the question there from John Richardson. Uh, we recognise the physical health impacts of extreme heat, but the mental health impacts are largely hidden. What are your strategies to address the mental health uh, impacts? There's a microphone just in front of you all there, just there. Um, what do we think? Yeah, it's a great, can, is that working? Yes. Yeah, great question. Uh, certainly uh, the mental health impacts are significant as uh, alluded to. We really are in the early stages of discovery, I would, I would say. I think that uh, many of those mental health impacts are unknown. Uh, that said, one of the things that we are focusing on at the City of Melbourne is um, enhancing and improving the resilience of our communities, really understanding how um, how people, particularly our residential communities, can be more connected to one another, to services, um, and to understand um, what is available within their community to access. We aren't always, of course, at local government level, we're not responsible for mental health services, but we do have a role to play in creating resilient, connected communities. And so that is an important area of focus for us. Great, Judith Kelly. Yeah. Um, so we haven't done anything in that area per se at the moment, but we have been working with some researchers working at Westmead Hospital and some other areas who are seeing those types of impacts. And I think 
um, particularly with those place-based studies at local emergency departments, which saw increase in, you know, um, injuries from domestic violence, other social altercations, even dog bites, how poor dogs are feeling cranky and not very well as well during these events, as well as um, exacerbating existing health, mental health conditions. And I think that's why having a lot more data and research into what types of impacts are happening rather than just those excess mortality figures is really important for informing responses moving forward. Okay, just uh, another quick question here. Uh, Mel Taylor led some great work on animals and emergencies. Uh, her question is, do you have any, uh, uh, that's gone on the side, sorry, uh, do you have any heat related resources or supports in Melbourne City or Western Sydney for animal owners in relation to heat? Um, we don't. I think we often um, link people through you know, on our social media during heat events through the RSPCA, who do have some great resources. We also picked up in one of our community workshops that giving chickens watermelon is a really great way to keep them cool. But other than that, unfortunately, we haven't had the focus on that area. I don't know if you've got anything in Melbourne. No, oh, it's a great question because we've seen a huge increase in pet ownership in the city um, through the pandemic and people really care for their pets. Uh, they're part of their family. Uh, yes, through our communication with the community, that's been very important um, to talk about the importance of keeping, pe keeping pets hydrated uh, and, of course, our um, animal shelters are a really important resource and we have an animal management team at the City of Melbourne who focus on this issue. Can I just very quickly add to this? One thing that we did uncover through some of our community workshops is um, uh, an issue that was not necessarily known to us is that when you are um, have vision impaired, when you are vision impaired and you've got a guide dog, apparently there's some strict rules about how the temperatures where guide dogs actually can't, are not allowed to go outside. And I think, what was it? Th 35 degrees and noting that Kelly just said that we in Western Sydney have months of 35 degrees, what impact does that have with people um, that have a disability or are reliant on those guide dogs when they're actually not allowed to get those guide dogs out? So just again, understanding the impacts across the board is really, really important. And we've got a few questions on Slido too about uh, urban design aspects. And we spoke a little bit about urban design in presentations, but particularly in regards to retrofitting. So there's a question there from Andrew McIntyre. Have there been any estimates of retrofitting heat smart design in existing suburbs? Flying to Melbourne this morning, I saw new subdivisions with boundary to boundary houses, just like Western Sydney. Uh, so less probably on uh, f future risk, but how can we uh, retrofit existing homes potentially for uh, heat smartness? to invent a new word. Yeah, so in terms of retrofitting um, existing suburbs, I think we there's a lot of evidence of what can be done and what possibly needs to be done. Um, at the moment where we really need support is quantifying some of those costs and particularly quantifying the cost of not acting. Um, so for us, we kind of know what needs to be done. Often where we get pushback is it's the cost. So making that case um, to our government stakeholders and otherwise is going to be increasingly important. Um, so we know that our existing homes are not necessarily up to scratch, let alone existing homes and like Tiffany rightly pointed out as well when we're looking at social and affordable housing um, often we get pushback around affordable housing whereas I think the case that we should be starting to make is what is affordability if people can't actually um, um, run their air conditioning or if they have to pay through their nose or if the costs are being pushed onto the health system we really need to start again quantifying and really being very um, more holistic about um, the impacts of heat and what we need to do to protect our community moving forward. Uh, we've got a big focus on retrofitting buildings in the city of Melbourne. Uh, we are principally focused on commercial buildings though, so I'm going to speak to that and take that opportunity. We have an, a really big piece of work ongoing at the moment around um, the upgrading of our commercial building stock. That's principally to bring down the emissions um, uh, profile of the city, but at the same time we want to create a city that um, is much more adapted, so uh, creating buildings that are cool, that are pleasant to be in. 
Um, there is so much more that we can be doing with industry, with researchers to normalise building standards that um, bet de better deliver to our community. I think, you know, sometimes I, we, we blame people for living in these houses boundary to boundary with black roofs. But if that's all that's being built and that's all that's required, um, then that's what people are going to buy and that's what they're going to live in. So we really have to continue to lift ambition and to innovate and to um, demand more, I think, from our building standards. Great. Thanks, Tiffany. We've got one question there from the floor. John Bates. Yeah, thanks. Uh, John Bates from State Emergency Service here in Victoria. One of the things that I think you've skirted around a little bit was the, the reliance upon a regular supply of electricity. I think most of the heatwave plans I've seen either rely on big corporates, the shopping centres and the like, but there's also an increasing reliance on individuals in their household to have that. We go into a heatwave where it's longer, it's hotter. Um, it's not just the lack of electricity, it's the equipment that provides that. Any thoughts on, on how we go? Because that's a real risk over the next five to ten years. Yeah, I think you're spot on and, and uh, one of the reasons that uh, perhaps we scattered around it is the fragmentation of governance around this issue. Um, we have looked at, um, uh, we have done some initial work around what could happen in a heat event when we see all of the, the, the system, the st systemic issues that follow on um, from critical systems failure around heat and the um, impacts are catastrophic. Uh, and, and, and that includes to, um, to businesses, to residents, to economies. Um, uh, we need a lot more cohesive action on this and it's certainly something that we'll be looking to advocate for. Um, I think that's a really great point and often uh, just even um, understanding, you know, what might happen when systems fail. So um, one of the examples we put up there was one of our member councils, Blacktown, who's been trialling heat refuges across the city to try and make free public spaces available as well as providing transport to and from those spaces. But when they were doing their risk assessments and their mapping and looking at that, one of the big considerations was if we hit some of the high temperatures we see in Western Sydney of 48, 50 degrees, are our air conditioners even going to work? Even if there is power to those air conditioners, the operational thresholds are actually well below the external temperatures. What happens when we bring lots of vulnerable people into a common space and then those systems fail? So there's a lot of um, broader thinking that needs to happen around our reliance on energy. I agree. I don't, we don't think we necessarily have the solutions, but at the moment we really need to start yeah, thinking about what happens when everything falls apart, basically. Great. We are unfortunately out of time for uh, any further questions. We've been really lucky here to have some real leaders in the urban heat space and really demonstrating the innovation and the use of science in uh, resilience around urban heat. So if you could please uh, uh, join me in thanking our very uh, well qualified and uh, very knowledgeable panel. So Kelly, Judith and uh, Tiffany. Okay, so um, next session up right now, a really exciting one. So some of you uh, may or may not have uh, already been involved in our uh, Be Ahead of Ready uh, workshops, uh, which is really about the future, right? So we've seen the last three years uh, so many different uh, crises and natural hazard events that have impacted our society. I think it's pretty safe to say that we've been somewhat behind uh, the ball, behind the curve, this is really a series of workshops that we've been running with researchers and leaders in, uh, in industry really about shaping, well, how can we get in front of the curve here? How can we get uh, in front of these future disasters? What are the big ideas that we need to start to be prosecuting? Thinking about big capability changes, thinking about uh, what are the policy changes that are needed to start to be thought about now and action to make sure that we're prepared for future decades, that we need to be thinking about how we future-proof our societies and then what are the key knowledge gaps that flow back uh, from that as well. So through these uh, workshops we've really been trying to focus on some innovation and we're also using some of the tools that we developed through the Bushfire Natural Hazard CRC around our climate scenarios uh, work as well. So 
the key uh, thing that we want to do over the next hour with the group is to involve you all in this workshop series. We've already run uh, 12 different workshops online. We've involved about 100 odd people. We're going to double that this afternoon with your participation. And it's a chance for you all to walk out of uh, this room feeling as though you've participated in some really future thinking about where our sector needs to go, to get a chance to influence the directions of our centre, through, through, centre and sector uh, through your participation participation in these various uh, workshops, uh, which we have one this afternoon. Um, I really encourage your participation. As I said to the students this morning, uh, when we run our student workshop, which is great success, it's your participation in forums like these, workshops that we're just about to hold, that really make these forums a success. So really encourage that uh, participation uh, as well. So really, it's a chance to put yourselves in the shoes of uh, people that are really spruiking the big ideas for the future, thinking that uh, you're in front of the, uh, the, the Prime Minister and what, what is the next big thing that we need to be investing in in the country? What are the, the big changes that we need to make to our policy systems and uh, capabilities for the future? We've been working with AETHA on, these, uh, on this uh, project, and I would also like to now introduce uh, Martin, Martin Goff, uh, from AETHA, who's going to facilitate our session this afternoon. Thank you, Andrew. Just checking that the microphone's on and working. Sounds like it is. So thank you and welcome to today's session. Uh, in a minute, we're going to get you up and about and moving and into some groups and generating some big ideas, like Andrew said. My name's Martin Goff. I'm from AETHA. I'll be facilitating the session today. And we've also got the fantastic team from NHRA who are going to be running some small group sessions, which will all make sense in a minute. But before we get started, I just wanted to reflect on why we're all here at this forum. And I think it's because we share a common purpose. We might all have our own really specific skills and interests, but we're all passionate about seeing better outcomes for our communities, our environments, and our economies that both support and are supported by those things. And we want to harness some of that passion today and get some of your big ideas to move us forward to face some of the challenges that we know are coming. I'm sure we've got a diversity of people in the room and a diversity of roles, but no matter what the role that you have, I'm sure that you're very, very busy and it requires you to have a laser focus on the task at hand and also to be reactive and responsive to problems and issues as they arise. And that means it's really hard to get the headspace to think beyond next week or next season, let alone out to some time like 2035 and think about what 2035 might actually look like. But we need to. There's a growing sense of urgency driven by climate change, population growth, and also demographic change, and a feeling that the resilient sector might not be as ready as it could be to meet some of those challenges. And we need to be ready and we need to be ahead of ready, as Andrew has said. The current trajectory and, uh, and progress of the resilient and emergency management sector, it might not be taking us down the path to our best case scenario for 2035. And if it isn't, we need to start thinking now about what we need to do to make sure we are on that path. And we've been helping NHRA with a range of um, workshops over the past uh, couple of months to help stimulate and generate future focused ideas uh, in both policy and capability that can help meet those challenges. And we wanna get your assistance with that task today. So this is the agenda that we've got. Um, I'm going to give a brief introduction of the project that we've been running so you can get some of that background, get some of what's actually been happening in some of those workshops. And then we're going to get you uh, into a couple of different uh, small group sessions. The first session, you'll have an opportunity to look at one of the focus areas. You might notice around the room there are a few different topics. And you'll get to go over there and talk about what you think the big ideas are. And the second session, you get to move around a little bit more freely and contribute your ideas to uh, multiple of those focus areas. So, as part of this project, we've run 12 discovery workshops with over 150 participants from a range of different organisations, public, private, researchers, and beyond. 
And we've had two workshops for each of the six focus areas, which I'll get to in a second. And we've been using a scenarios-based approach to generate those future-focused ideas. The workshops have also generated six cross-cutting themes, which are really the priority areas that have been identified that need to be looked at and where action is needed most. And we've generated some multiple big ideas, and I'll get to some of those examples as well in a second. So here are the six focus areas that used to guide the development um, and attendance at each discovery workshop. So we've got next generation capability, risk mitigation, land use planning and urban design, environmental solutions, resilient recovery, and social equity. And they're the groups that we'll be asking you to split up into today. We've also de developed scenarios tailored to each of those focus areas, and we use, use both the best case and the worst case scenario. And we essentially asked, what are the transformative policy and capability ideas that are required to either get us to achieve the best case scenario or avoid the worst case scenario? And from the 12 workshops, we identified these six cross-cutting themes above. And these themes really indicate where participants thought we needed action and, we, and areas that required change and were highest priority and going to have the biggest impact as well. These themes might look a little bit familiar. You might have seen some of these before, and that's OK. What we really want is um, tangible ideas that move us from general problems or general solutions to specific actions that will shift us onto the right path. You consider these themes that can guide your thinking today. Which theme do you think is most important? What would you do if you had the opportunity to shift this theme? And here are some ideas to get you into gear and get your mind going. So here's some of the ideas that came out of some of the workshops. It's just a selection. So things like implement a national initiative to develop local display building showcasing resilient design. Expand membership of, the, of AFAC. Provide tax incentives for emergency management volunteer services. Establish a national bureau of pyrogeography. Glad I got that word right. Establish a national community of practice model for local government. Um, develop open data policies. Undertake a national skills assessment. I'm sure you're reading ahead anyway. I don't need to read them all out. But these are what came up, just some ideas that came up. Just some workshop principles before we get moving. So that then it's going to keep us focused and have a good time. So remember to focus on ideas that address future needs, just not just respond to current needs. Um, secondly, stay curious. Um, there's going to be a diversity of views in the room. Um, that's OK. We want to go through a process of discovery, not necessarily agree on everything. Finally, we need to gather your ideas, but we also want you to keep the conversation going. So have a conversation in your groups. Take it into the other sessions at the forum today and keep that conversation going, because the more we share our ideas and refine them, the better they're going to be. And finally, if you've got an important phone call or conversation that you really need to have, you can have that out in the foyer, and we'll keep everyone here actively participating. So like Andrew said before, if you also need to get your head into it, imagine the Prime Minister's called you up to a task force and said, what's your idea to shift us onto the right path? So you can think about that. Or you can just think about, what would I do in the next 12 months or five years to get us on the right path? All right, so in a second, we are going to break up into groups. And what we're going to do is you're going to move around to the area that you choose. Um, we've got environmental solutions here. Risk mitigation is going to be in the middle of the room. Then we've got next generation capability over there, land use planning and urban design social equity, and resilient recovery. So you'll have NHRA facilitators. There is a best case scenario that you can read if that also helps generate your thoughts. And then what we're going to do is we've got post-it notes. You can write down some of your ideas and, and hopefully why you think it's a good idea. But also we want you to start talking to the people around you, questioning why um, someone else thinks that's a good idea. And then we're going to um, have a discussion within those groups around what we think are the priority big ideas and then we're going to report back. And then you'll have another chance to move around the room. So I want everyone to stand up and choose the area that they'd like to go to and start generating those big ideas. <laughs> 